I think we can get started and hello to everyone out there. It's nice to see all of you on the other side of the Zoom screen. Um, my name is Steve Wellmeyer and I'll be your webinar co-host today. I manage Poseidon's North American office from Providence, Rhode Island. It's a very <laughs> damp and rainy day here um, for midsummer. Uh, and as you can see, I'm working from home like, like many of you probably are as well. Um, before we get started, uh, we want to make sure you can hear, hear us well, so if you, if you don't mind, if you can type the plus sign into your chat box, uh, you can find your chat box at the bottom of the screen, and I can uh, kind of make sure everybody can, can hear us there. Yes, yes, Natalie, Betsy, yes, Kate, Jennifer, perfect, perfect. So it sounds like we're coming through loud and clear, great. So we're gonna talk about uh, what we like to say is one of the ultimate travel experiences on Earth, and that's a icebreaker cruise to the North Pole, to the top of the world, 90 degrees north latitude. And we'll try to cover some of the following topics today. What's so unique and special about this trip? What will you see and do while you're, while you're with us? And why does this bucket list journey attract travelers from, from all over the world? Also, we'll have some tips and suggestions for this trip from our guest speaker. Fortunately for all you webinar participants, you, Lewis Jones, will be doing most of the talking today. And that's great because he's spent much of his recent years in the polar regions. You, why don't you just uh, say hello to everyone? Uh, and then we can, we can move on uh, with a little background on the company. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, and hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for, for tuning on in. Good morning to, well, good afternoon, I suppose, now in America, and um, good evening to those of you on the other side of the world. Uh, that's right. I'm Hugh. You'll be hearing plenty more from me uh, later uh, in this session. We have over 100 images uh, to show you a voyage all the way to the North Pole. So buckle up, and I'll be uh, back with you shortly. So we want to leave time at the, at the end of the webinar also for, to, for you to ask questions. And uh, so we'll go for about 40 minutes or so, the next 40 minutes, and then uh, that'll give us some time for Q&A afterwards. And if during the presentation you have some questions, um, please feel free to type them into your chat box and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, and my association with Poseidon. I've been the managing director of Poseidon Expeditions since um, 2014 when I opened the North American office. Uh, but I've been involved in small ship travel and expedition cruise travel uh, for quite a, a bit longer than that since 1983 when I first got into the business with a small ship operator. Uh, and I've been involved in polar region cruising since uh, the late 90s. Um, I also served uh, for five years as the executive director of IATO, which is the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. So it gave me a great opportunity to know all of the players in this business and the many uh, tourism related issues when it comes to the polar regions. Um, so I've, I love the polar uh, business, the polar tourism business. I'm not a field guy like you. Uh, my background is more in marketing and sales, but it takes a lot of different types to make a company successful. And I, I feel very fortunate to be associated with Poseidon, uh, which is at the forefront of polar expedition cruising. Yu is joining us from, uh, he said he had just been for a swim at the beach and he's talking about the Southwest England, uh, Cornwall, where he is with his family. And it gives you a sense of the international nature of Poseidon Expeditions. We have offices in the UK, in the US, uh, Germany, Cyprus, Moscow, and, and China. And I think most of the participants uh, joining us today are from North America. If you want, uh, why don't you type in to the chat function uh, where, you're, where you're listening from. And, and uh, we're, we're curious to see where, where, you, where you all are today. Florida, yeah. Okay, I know there's some people from Texas, uh, Maryland, Texas, great. Canada, super. Massachusetts, just right up the road from me in, in Rhode Island. And we have one of my fellow colleagues is listening in from Moscow where they're seven hours ahead. So it, 
she's working late tonight, seven o'clock. <laughs> Here's some people in Florida, great. They must have traveled with you, you, because they're telling, they're wishing you hello, so. Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the international nature of Poseidon and, and you being in Cornwall reminds me about the passenger makeup of our, mm. uh, aboard our ships uh, as we explore the polar regions. And we market all over the world. And, and um, so on this North Pole voyage and most of our other cruises, you'll meet fellow adventurers from all over, all over the world, many different countries. And I think that's very appropriate, particularly in a place like the North Pole or Antarctica. These are places that are not sovereign territory to any one nation. And subsequently, they don't belong to anyone. And at the same time, they, they belong to everyone. So I think it's a perfect kind of a cruise to meet people from all over the world. So let me give this, just give you a, a little bit of background on the company. Um, Poseidon was formed in 1999, and as a company, we're incorporated in the United Kingdom. Uh, our first program and our bread and butter programs for a number of years was to the North Pole on, on icebreaker cruises to the North Pole and in the, in the Russian uh, high Arctic. Uh, and initially, these trips were aboard the, the Yamal, which is a kind of a sister ship of the current vessel that we use for tourism, the 50 Years of Victory. And, You'll see a picture of the Amal there. It's got a very distinctive bow, as you can see. Uh, so we did that for a number of years. And then in the last decade, the, the company wanted to expand and get more involved in other types of polar expedition cruising. So we took on the long-term charter of the 114 passenger Sea Spirit. You can see it there, it's a much smaller vessel than, than the 50 Years of Victory. And we started operating cruises to Antarctica in 2013, and we, we continue to do so. And uh, we're, at this point, we're very much looking forward to our next Antarctic season starting later this huh? fall. Um, so the, the Sea Spirit, unlike the 50 Years of Victory, is a, is a migrating Glitchy. vessel. Like, uh, like, like the migrating birds, we follow the seasons, we follow the sun, and we're in Antarctica during the astral summer. And then in, in the Northern Hemisphere summer, we're in the Arctic. Um, at this point, um, before we talk more about the North Pole, I'm going to turn it over to you, and he can tell you a little bit about, what, about himself and what he's been up to. And then he can take you on a tour of the ship. So well, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. I, I should just say you've seen some pictures of Steve there. We, he really is one of the best in the business, certainly running the US operations. Um, a fantastic guy for you to all be dealing with. Um, for my own part, the metaphor was a, a, a migratory bird. And yeah, my spirit animal is an Arctic tern, spends half of its year in the Northern Hemisphere, and breeding in Cornwall, perhaps flying to the Arctic or flying all the way to Antarctica, amazing distances. Um, this is what my day job looks like normally when I'm not uh, sheltering at home like the rest of you. Uh, in a waterproof jacket, speaking into the radio on the side of a volcano. Uh, but as Steve said, I have quite a long career in the polar regions. I've been uh, writing and uh, guiding for the best part of 20 years. Uh, I got into the business for days like this. It's not always as nice as this. This is driving Zodiac boats off the west coast of Greenland. But actually, I got into the business as a historian and a bird watcher. I'm a, a, a naturalist, a bird nerd. Uh, if you like. Um, so whether it's penguins and albatross, in this case in the southern hemisphere, or uh, other seabirds in the north, that, those are the big draws for me as a guide. Now as an expedition leader, I get real, a real kick out of organising the logistics. Sounds a bit boring, but we make very complicated expeditions uh, look easy, I like to think. Uh, it is not a cruise that we will take you on, but uh, an expedition in the truest uh, sense. Uh, and one of the, the reasons we're able to achieve what we do is we have a fantastic team. Uh, this is the team from Greenland, filled with expedition leaders, not just myself, uh, skills truly from all over the world. South America, England, uh, Spain, uh, uh, Scandinavian Viking goddess who skied all the way to the North Pole, our kayak master. Real uh, strength in depth. What unites us all is our love of the polar uh, environment whether it be walrus or polar bear, and also the sense of achievement that you get when uh, you're lucky enough to stand at the top of the world. And we're gonna to come to that. So um, 
that was a sort of a loose and fast introduction. I'm a polar historian, uh, an author, now expedition leader. Uh, I've been working for the last 20 years. I love the polar regions uh, and that um, enthusiasm hasn't diminished. Each time I go, I have to say it gets better and better. That's probably enough for me, I think, Steve. Uh, okay. Let's get the show on the road. Um, you'll notice behind me, it's not a prop. This is the main event, the star of the show when it comes to this expedition, our ship. I don't know, Steve, if you wanted just to say a few words before I rattle on for the next half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Let me talk just a bit about some of the statistics of the ship. Um, relative to the number of passengers transported, it's a, it's a large ship. It's, it's a uh, uh, passenger contingent is typically about 125 or so, um, but relative to the number of passengers, it's a very large vessel. Uh, it's 160 meters long and 30 meters wide, and it's nearly as large as a modern cruise ship that carries up to a thousand passengers. So that gives you some sense of how much room you have on board this massive icebreaker. There are six different category cabins on board from 14 up to 33 uh, square meters on four different passenger decks, but there's loads of outside deck space and, and, and you will be showing you some pictures of that, of that space. And, and when I went two summers ago, I just was constantly looking for fantastic vantage points. There's so many places on this ship to get, get great views of what's going on around you. Um, it has a unbelievable ice class rating that's rated LL1, which is equivalent to PC1, which is a general classification, which means it can go anywhere in the Arctic at any time of the year. So summer or winter, it's certified to travel through the ice. So there's really very few vessels, really no other ships that carry passenger vessels that can do this. Uh, it carries a crew of about 140 and an expedition staff of about uh, anywhere from 15 to 20, and, and I'll let you talk to you more about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, before we, even, we get into the, the details of the, the voyage itself, for many people, this, myself included, this ship it is the main event, 75,000 horsepower, one of the most powerful ever built. Really, um, with so much uncertainty in the Arctic, we have certainty with this ship. 99.9% .9 will get you there and back safely. Um, a really formidable ship with the best uh, Russian um, skill set available, experienced captain, amazing pilots, and all of these things. You'll find I say the word amazing uh, quite a lot because it really is remarkable. Amazing perhaps isn't a word you might describe the cabins, but I guarantee they are the most luxurious cabins you'll find on a Russian nuclear icebreaker. This is a working vessel. You know, it is not a luxury cruise ship. If it was, I wouldn't be expedition media. No interest at all to go on one of those big cruise ships. This really is the right vehicle in the right uh, environment. Um, so there are lots of cabins. We do find, of course, that passengers don't spend a huge amount of time uh, in their cabins. The uh, shared facilities are very good. The restaurant uh, is absolutely top quality. Uh, but most passengers, as, as Steve already said, spend a large part of their time outside on, on deck, uh, of course, uh, the journey is about the wildlife and the environment. But food is important, of course, no doubt. An expensive uh, voyage and top quality food to go with it. We have chefs uh, from Europe, typically uh, Austria, Germany, uh, but also we cater to a, a, a wide range uh, of international uh, tastes. As uh, Steve already mentioned at the head of this uh, session, uh, the range of nationalities. Well, I made a, a little note this time last year, our first voyage of the season, uh, 120 guests, 16 nationalities, uh, Austrian, Canadian, Chinese, French, German, Indian, Norwegian, uh, Dutch, Japanese, Taiwanese, Russian, of course, uh, I'm reading from the list, South Africa, Switzerland, UK and USA. Okay, so uh, a huge amount of food tastes, um, uh, uh, wine, wine and, uh, and whiskey, of course, tastes good across many languages. But we are able to, to accommodate specific dietary requests also. Uh, not just eating inside, uh, we're able to do outside dining as well. More on that uh, later. Uh, the heart of the soul, the heart of many ships is the bar. Uh, this a shot from the Victory Bar. The most northerly uh, 
refueling station in the world, you might say, but really well equipped and beautiful. You'll see the windows uh, behind the, the shoulders of the expedition team drinking at the bar in this photo, uh, looking out into the ice. And you can sit there with your hot chocolate or your whiskey, uh, watching wildlife almost all hours uh, of the day. Uh, we have an after saloon, very large for events. This is Tamash, our musician, um, uh, doing some background music. Uh, a shot of the library. These are all sort of not the greatest shot, I should say. It's, it's very well equipped, this library. Of course, there's no one in it at this point because there's probably a bear outside. Everyone has, has, has scattered for the outside decks. But we do use this space for gatherings and formal lectures, uh, films sometimes, uh, art workshops. Uh, there is a shop often the most frequently asked question, when is the shop opening? As an expedition leader, these are the important things. If you have any desire for polar bear, ties, underwear, socks, cuddly toys for your grandchildren, uh, this absolutely is the best polar shop on this ship. <laughs> um, as I said, the Arf Saloon, a place where we all gather for briefings, and I'll talk more about that as we go to the nitty gritty, but we have excellent uh, visiting speakers. I say this totally biased, this is actually a, a picture of my wife talking about her late father. That's my wife, a little girl on her father's shoulders. Um, we have a gym, that's morning Tai Chi. Uh, often there are uh, basketball matches or badminton matches, ships crew against passengers, all rather fun. Uh, and why not? A nuclear heated swimming pool and sauna. Uh, newly decorated, absolutely fantastic. You can feel the throb of the engines and the ice as you're doing your laps every morning, if that is your thing. Uh, a working ship, as I said, we're blessed with an incredible bridge that is open to us. You can't always say that on ships of this size. Uh, and a, a Russian uh, officers a team who are very accepting of us getting rather excited. We remain quiet on the bridge, but it does provide fantastic viewing opportunities. And not just on the bridge, I should say, on that blue roof, um, a huge observation deck, uh, the highest point are on the ship. Uh, it's worth mentioning um, the captain at this point. This is Captain Dmitry Lobosov. I think the most experienced ice captain that has ever uh, lived. He's a wonderful uh, fellow. I really enjoy working with him as an expedition leader. I think I'm right in saying, Steve, that um, Poseidon, you guys have just uh, made an interview with um, Dmitry describing his work. Yes, and, and following this webinar, we'll We'll follow up with everyone uh, by email and we'll send you a link to a very interesting video interview with him. Uh, he's a very cool customer. He, uh, he's always got a very calm demeanor, which of course is what you want on a trip like this. But it's a, it's a quite fascinating interview about his intimate knowledge of this vessel, which he's been associated with for many years. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's absolutely fantastic. The vessel itself has been to the North Pole over 50 times, but he really is uh, the most skilled ice captain in the fleet. He actually brought his daughter uh, and family members on a previous voyage. He's a lovely man, of course, uh, and our passengers get a chance to meet the captains. If, it not, if not Dimitri, another captain called Captain Oleg. Uh, there are captain's cocktails events, a chance to sit in the cabin of the captain around the table that uh, Vladimir Putin sits at when he uh, inspects the ship, uh, etc. So, um, you know, this is a real experience of, of Russia, you know, almost behind the scenes uh, on a very important ship, one of the most important in the fleet. Uh, at the back of the ship, uh, the heli deck, uh, this is a Russian Mi-2 helicopter. We'll come into detail about that later for those interested, but it really extends our capability on a voyage like this, an absolute additional highlight, the use of the helicopter. And the open decks, as Steve has already uh, suggested, perfect. Uh, platforms for wildlife observation uh, moving through an environment like this. And also pretty perfect. Look, this is about 100 miles from the pole, perfect for an outdoor barbecue. Looks a bit like an alpine ski resort, and why not? When the sun shines in the Arctic, we take full advantage uh, of it um, uh, as, we, as we make our progress uh, northward. So it's about time we actually started on a voyage. Uh, Steve, here's a map. It's always a good place to start. Perhaps you'd, you'd like to uh, add a few words whilst I take a gulp on my cup of tea. Yeah, sure. Um, 
These programs begin uh, and end in Murmansk, which is not shown on this particular map, but it's to the east of Norway uh, in, in Murmansk sits on the Kola Peninsula in the Kola, uh, I'm sorry, the Kola Bay, which is at the southern end of the Barents Sea. And uh, of course, we, we head north up through the Barents Sea into the Arctic Ocean uh, through Franz Josef Land up to the North Pole. The total voyage, uh, the program is 13 days of which 12 of those days, 11 nights are spent on the, uh, on the vessel itself. The first night is spent at the Azimut Hotel and I'll let, I'll let um, you tell you a little bit more about that where we meet you and greet you and, and begin your journey. Yes, I mean, it's good. Every journey starts with a map. I think um, for most people, they find the most difficult part of this voyage is getting to Murmansk, but really in today's travel, albeit all of our travels are restricted, uh, theoretically is pretty straightforward into St. Petersburg or Moscow, a connecting flight uh, to Murmansk and a very, very uh, comfortable uh, hotel in Murmansk city, a city in the Arctic at 69 degrees north, 21 degrees from the pole. So best part of 1200 nautical miles, probably speaking in gobbledygook right now, that's um, a few thousand kilometers, 2,300 kilometers uh, from the North Pole, where our journey begins. Um, some passengers choose to arrive a few days early. There's plenty of tourism here. Uh, this is a shot of the Lenin, the world's first nuclear surface ship, now a, a floating museum, quite fascinating uh, in its way. But for many people, bleary eyed from a, an all night flight or from some corner of the world, this is the welcome that they get. Two members of our expedition team, a German geologist and a Chinese uh, super translator, Yvonne, uh, to welcome you, to uh, give you some information, your room keys, everything has been sorted for you. The following morning, typically, um, perhaps it's in between voyages, I've just rushed from a North Pole voyage and come into town to give a briefing. I'll meet you in the, in the hotel uh, and give you a short but sharp briefing because from the hotel to the ship is actually the hardest bit of the whole voyage. We have to enter a Russian nuclear facility uh, the uh, entry requirements are quite straightforward, but it takes a bit of time and we, uh, we all join specific transfers or buses and, and get you onto the ship in good order. We then sail with the tide uh, and the journey begins. So the first photo of thousands, no doubt, we come up the gangway and join the team on the ship. Uh, Steve, shall I talk, talk us through a typical voyage? I, th I think that probably is the easiest way uh, to go. I've got slides here roughly chronologically for a voyage. So as Steve said, um, 11 nights, um, which perhaps doesn't seem that much to get to the pole and back, uh, but we use every, every day uh, filled with activities. The first night you'll uh, meet the captain actually as a captain's cocktail, dependent on um, uh, what time we've left in the evening. Certainly a chance to meet your fellow passengers. Uh, meet some of the expedition team. There's Flipper, our logistics expert in a freshly laundered shirt. He doesn't often wear a smart shirt, truth be told. He's a, a beardy boatman just like me, but it's really nice. Um, these events aren't particularly smart. It's not mandatory to dress up, but some people choose to, um, to come uh, very smartly dressed. It's rather nice uh, when we do champagne events to, to, to um, dress smartly. A chance for passengers, young and old, from many nationalities to come together and, and meet uh, for the first time. Uh, this is a familiar sight, I'm afraid, me giving boring but very important briefings uh, each day, often uh, different safety briefings for different aspects or um, all sorts of other education and entertainment from our guest speakers on board. Uh, this is a shot, actually, uh, for our Russian friends, uh, an explorer called Fyodor Kornikov, one of our guest speakers last season, immense traveller, not much known outside of Russia, it's been truth be told, but uh, has sailed the oceans, trekked both north and south, flown in hot air balloons. He was a real highlight. But we have um, guest speakers drawn from all over the world, filmmakers, scientists, uh, uh, photographers, I'm particularly sort of keen on world-class photographers joining us to um, entertain us as much as educators uh, on our travel northward. Uh, our expedition team is also composed of Russian uh, National Park Rangers. This was a nice event last season, a happy Ranger Day in Russia, 
uh, and with representatives from WWF uh, Moscow conservationists coming with us uh, to continue their polar bear studies. Uh, art class, you don't have to sit on the floor, but why not? People picking up pencils for the first time. Um, some people say, you know, they're worried they go on a trip like this, perhaps they'll be bored for four or five days uh, at sea. But of course, we're not at sea, we're moving through the ice, we're filling our days with activities also, and wildlife watching being the most important. So as Steve said, uh, the ship, a big ship like this is blessed with a huge amount of outdoor space. Look at this passenger standing on the bow as we move through the Barents Sea at this point, uh, the most northerly person on that ship, at least, looking very warm and toasty as we enter the sea ice in uh, the Red Parkers. Um, I, I suppose we, we should mention it uh, on day one, all the passengers um, are fitted out with this Poseidon Parker, which really is an excellent jacket. It's a question we often get asked about clothing, of course, I'm sure all of you will be asking those questions. This jacket that's provided is warm, it's waterproof. Um, yeah, it's, it's all you, you really require with some layers underneath uh, to keep you warm. Um, we're blessed with good weather sometimes, and can you believe it? It's absolutely sunny and beautiful. Uh, at other times, really uh, very, um, how should we say, atmospheric and challenging. It is the Arctic, of course, but when we're blessed with sunshine, absolutely, the voyage becomes one big photo shoot, uh, and why not? Um, those red jackets look particularly fantastic against the white sea ice. For some people, it's not about photos for myself. It's more about the pleasure of walking the outside decks. I do this regularly as an expedition leader to chat to people and people just sitting, enjoying the silence, the quiet, the beauty of this environment, the space. I mean, we, live, we all live such busy, crowded lives, don't we? confined lives at this particular point in history. Imagine being on a ship with uh, thousands of miles of uh, wilderness, hundreds of miles. Uh, you can almost see the curvature of the earth across the sea ice. It's really very, very special. Goodness. A picture of my feet. <laughs> We're aware of tradition on this ship. This is Neptune or Poseidon, I should say, coming to, to greet us as we enter the true polar zone. Uh, the ship's company that have decorated the Earth Saloon for us with flags. Perhaps you'll kiss Neptune's wife's feet, you'll drink some vodka, have your temperature measured, you must make sure you, uh, you're in good fitness for getting to the pole. Uh, it's a ceremony and we're, we, we do all sorts of things. None of these are mandatory, but some people choose to dress up. There are costumes available. For most people, the party uh, is kind of just a small element. It's more about the wilderness and the nature. Here's a lovely photograph, isn't it? This is a fog bow, a rainbow made from fog. Uh, with tremendous atmospheric effects as you head uh, farther north through the shifting uh, ice pack. The big highlight for most people, myself included, is the wildlife, of course. Uh, we're entering the, the kingdom of the ice bear. We travel through remote island archipelagos, uh, both marine life and uh, polar bears. At almost every moment on the ship, if we have ice, it's plausible that we will see uh, polar bears. And when we do the ship, this is the big advantage of being on a nuclear ship, we're almost silent, the engines can stop, uh, we'll pull into the ice and the polar bear will come and check us out. Really, they're very, very curious. Those red Parker jackets look very interesting to a polar bear, no doubt. Um, but they'll come and, and, and sniffers and sensors and explore uh, and then leave. Um, we often leave a polar bear. We will back off slowly and gently and the polar bears really are unaffected by our visit. Uh, we're blessed sometimes with sightings of mothers and their cubs. Often one, sometimes two, very rarely three, but a mother with two cubs, that's a, a treat, absolutely. And as I say, um, the juvenile cubs, very curious, will often come uh, super close to the ship. And as I say, watching wildlife from a ship is the perfect platform for us. We couldn't possibly get this close. Uh, certainly if you were on the ice this close, you'd be very worried. But on the ship, it's perfect for photography. As we head north, um, it's not just a flat wilderness of ice. Uh, the Franz Josef Land Archipelago, which we'll talk about a bit later, a credible glacial ice forms that, uh, you know, with a ship like this, with its ice capability, as Steve mentioned, uh, we really can go anywhere uh, that we'd like safely. 
But also as we travel farther north, we saw this a lot last season, very difficult ice conditions actually. And we had the most amazing icebergs trapped within the ice pack itself. And again, if we see that kind of uh, cathedral of ice, uh, we can navigate all the way to it uh, and explore it photographically. So wonderful opportunities. Uh, this is a shot, for example, looking down from the ship as we're moving uh, many meters thick through that ice, that ancient blue ice, or taking the chance to fly. And uh, when I speak to passengers, often this uh, is a highlight that the chance to use these Russian helicopters. We forgot to ask, didn't we, um, whether people had been on a North Pole voyage before. Uh, some people, maybe in the chat, folks, maybe you'll tell us, but for some people, this is their first time in a helicopter. Uh, and why not first time in a helicopter over the frozen ocean as the ship continues its journey north? Uh, we have a very experienced helicopter operations team um, and, you know, at all, all moments we will try to fly. Typically, uh, two flights uh, you'll, you'll get per voyage, depending on the weather. Um, absolutely, we, uh, we try for more, more than that if conditions allow and fuel uh, allows. Uh, but really it is uh, very special. Um, we have full safety briefings giving you all the information you need how to get on and off safely and what to expect. Every seat in that helicopter is a good seat. Look at the views. This is uh, Sergei Gorshkov, a very famous conservation photographer who was with us last uh, season. Whether professional photographer or iPhone photographer, uh, much can be achieved from the inside of that helicopter. Perhaps you've arranged with your friends like these, these folks do for your friends to run to the front of the bow as you, you circle the ship in the helicopter. Sometimes the helicopter will travel so far from the ship that all you can see is a small red dot on the horizon, the most amazing wilderness of ice. But look, here's a, a picture to remind me that um, four or five days into the voyage, we're getting into the business end of operation. Um, the North Pole is approaching and for the, the best part of a day, the captain, uh, Dimitri and myself will be on the bridge, uh, really studying the charts. Um, as I said, with some certainty we can get to the pole, but actually precisely getting to that fabled 90 degrees uh, is, is a challenge and we always achieve it, but sometimes it takes a, a little longer uh, than normal, but um, it's, a, it's a brilliant sense of achievement for everyone. Uh, what happens? Uh, well, um, we count down the hours. Um, often we'll arrive, well, often. Last season it was typically uh, sort of midnight, uh, which sounds a little late, but we have sunlight, of course, so we uh, celebrated handshakes all round. Why not? The expedition team at this point have gathered uh, everyone on the bow. This is midnight. Look, a shot from midnight um, last season. Uh, music, champagne, partying, uh, general celebration, and why not? And then hopefully an early night. <laughs> I keep having to remind my expedition team at this point to get an early night because the day begins very early the following. Uh, always a team photo, why not at the North Pole? Uh, again, that was, I think that was two in the morning. You see how bright it is for two in the morning. Uh, very, very exciting. Uh, but the true action begins uh, in the morning of the following day. Uh, my expedition team, hopefully if they've had some sleep, will be then on the ice a few hours before uh, passengers, typically straight after breakfast, uh, will have set up uh, a polar bear safe zone um, and also set up all the other things that we hope to achieve for the day. Most important of all, we've brought the North Pole sign with us. <laughs> Often people are amazed that we're able, able to reach the sign with precision each year. Well, we bring it with us. We don't leave trash behind. The North Pole would float uh, all the way down to Iceland if we left it for the season. Uh, but nonetheless, that sign becomes a symbol, a focus point. Uh, so typically, we would gather first on the ice around the North Pole for a ceremony, a very short ceremony. The captain will give a speech. As I said, he's been many times, but each time is significant uh, for all of our all of the team as much as the, the, the expedition is with us. Um, a few minutes silence, perhaps a party, then people usually race to touch that sign for the first time. Look, that year we were doing a conga dance and why not? And then people really are left to their own devices. We have a program of events, but I really don't like to crowd the day with too much. Some people choose just to sit in the ice all day and soak in uh, the sense of achievement. 
Others, um, after I predict this is uh, the millionth photograph of the day, others decide to, to celebrate in different ways. Um, um, eating, maybe pulling the ship. Look, there's a, a bar rope that's laid down. You won't be able to pull the ship. It's fast in the ice. The ice is many meters thick. Uh, beautiful shots, aren't they? Absolutely. That's a, a hundred spelt out. That was the hundredth voyage um, you can see there. Uh, lunchtime, uh, no one's going starving. This uh, conditions allowed us to set up a barbecue on the ice, which is really pretty special. It's a bit, as I said, it's a bit like being in an alpine ski resort. Um, wonderful food and friendship. Uh, conditions were good that year. A long hike, many miles from the ship with polar bear guides, getting a sense of what it would be like to ski to the pole, to be, you know, imagine standing on a floating uh, uh, iceberg. I mean, this is effectively what you're doing, a frozen ocean. Uh, that, uh, for many people, is magic enough. Um, some years we have uh, sea ice scientists with us on the expedition team doing legitimate citizen science measurements of sea ice ponds. But as these folks are doing, just enjoying drinking in the view and taking some photos, maybe taking a dip. This is one of our colleagues from the office, uh, but many passengers go for a swim. I, I like to swim each year if I can. And, uh, and yeah, it's why not? It's an experience, uh, not mandatory, but we do find about half of our passengers choose to swim. And those that haven't swum seem to regret that they, they didn't. Uh, why not? You don't need to stay in for very long. And of course, you can have a glass of vodka on the way out. Uh, last year, we had a wedding at the pole, the captain officiating. I think I'm right in saying, Steve, we haven't yet had a divorce, fingers crossed. Uh, but we do have um, uh, all sorts of unexpected events, which does lead me neatly onto this photograph. Uh, I, it's a plant. I knew you'd put this photograph in. But uh, Steve, would you like me to tell a little story about this image? Yeah, this is a great story. And uh, I think we wanted to include it, not because it's something that typically happens on our usual voyages to the North Pole, but it just did happen last, last summer. And you was fortunate enough to be expedition leader on this trip. And uh, so tell them the story, you. <laughs> well, look, I, I, to see a polar bear on it any day in the Arctic is a blessing. To see one at 90 degrees north, uh, is a, a blessing a hundredfold. Very, very unusual. Uh, polar bears, of course, travel across the Arctic, but uh, they tend to prefer to stay at the ice edge where there are seals abundant. But yes, imagine the scene as expedition leader, everyone out on the ice, and within half an hour we were doing an evacuation of the ice. Uh, but we have plans, uh, and in fact it was really nice to see the, the system working. Uh, within half an hour, um, the polar bear was at the ship, but everyone was safely on board. And we had the most incredible wildlife encounter. Uh, obviously, the polar bear checking out our perimeter flags and then the North Pole itself posing for its photograph. Um, the bear stayed with the ship for a while. Uh, we let the bear continue on its journey. Uh, that day, uh, we felt it wasn't safe to continue on the ice, but the passengers had a second uh, North Polar event the following day. Um, so yeah, it really was a lucky uh, blessing. I can't promise that we'll see an, a polar bear at the North Pole again, uh, but it does prove to me and my expedition team that we have to take uh, the threat of polar bears uh, seriously. But uh, it really was a blessing to see a creature uh, so close um, on that particular occasion. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a lovely North Pole that particular season. Every North Pole is, is good for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the thing I, I have to manage, um, on the second half of, of a voyage is some people assume that, um, you know, once you've achieved the pole, then that's it. You know, you're sort of riding a ship home and, and um, perhaps feeling a bit sad about uh, the end of your holiday. And I actually find that the experience is, is absolutely the reverse. Uh, once the pole has been achieved, people sort of breathe a collective sigh of relief and then the fun really begins. You know, the sense of achievement is absolutely there. We have more helicopter flights, more wildlife viewing. Uh, but then we, we have what, what I think is the highlight of a North Polar voyage to look forward to, which is the Franz Josef Land archipelago. We go on a North Pole voyage to feel like an explorer, perhaps. Well, visiting Franz Josef really is still something of true exploration. 191 islands, many of which still little explored. And with a ship, uh, and uh, an expedition crew and maps at hand, we can really try and get to many places that uh, are really very um, uh, uh, little explored. 
Uh, the ship can travel uh, close along the ice front of prodigious glaciers. Uh, we can head to remote land islands where few have landed before to go for a hike in the wilderness. It's lovely to stretch your legs after a number of days ashore. Uh, we can get the helicopters up, of course. You know, we're blessed if we're blessed with good conditions. We can fly over islands that people have never flown over before. Uh, this is quite a famous landmark, Cape Tegatov. Beautiful scenery, isn't it? This actually is, I guess, the start of the story of the Franz Josef Land Archipelago, the first point of the island group ever discovered in the 1870s. The world's most northerly island group discovered by accident. So lots of history here, both from above and below. Uh, and wildlife too, amazing bird cliffs. This is Rubini Rock. Um, um, yeah, phenomenal if you're a birder like me. Uh, hey, thousands. you, you one, of the, one of the things that I, I find fascinating, and since I think we've got mostly Americans with us today, is, is the history of, of polar exploration with, with some American expeditions at the end of the 19th mm -hmm. century and beginning of the 20th century. And uh, unfortunately, I guess you'd say they, they were all failures, but I think for most Americans, uh, the, that aspect of polar history is, is fascinating. It's, it's one of the things we, we do learn about on board the trip. Yeah, it's hugely so. And I would, I would disagree that uh, to view any of those expeditions on failures, we benefit from the knowledge that goes before. Uh, a sequence of American expeditions, hoping to fly to the pole, walk to the pole, trek to the pole. Um, yeah, we're lucky. I mean, last season we pioneered a new landing at a site with a, an American, the remains of an American hut. Um, there are other sites, I think of Cape Flora and, and others often on our sail plan uh, where there's, there, there is history to be seen, as well as the stories. Uh, I think of Nansen, perhaps a famous name that some of your um, clients may have heard of, and we can revisit his story with the site that he overwintered, surviving a winter in a hut made from his own hands with a skin, uh, skin wall or skin roof, phenomenal uh, survival story on a par with Shackleton. So all of these stories combine in, in an archipelago like Franz Josef. Uh, but as I said, I'm a bird nerd at heart. So thousands of full, full mars kittiwakes and, and guillemots uh, muirs uh, on a cliff edge and with a ship like ours in deep water we can bring the ship right up close close as close as it's possible to bring a ship safely and not disturb the wildlife uh, history wildlife geology these are the concretic excretions on champ island named for an american whaling captain actually um, um phenomenal sort of um formation and again another chance for a hike we had polar bears actually here last uh, season uh, but very interesting not to take souvenirs, we take nothing but memories, but very interesting to see the geology and wildlife. And I, as I said, wildlife really is the draw. Um, I can't promise narwhal and whale, but pretty certain to promise walrus. We know where the fallouts are. We see them very frequently on the ice in and around the archipelago. Walrus with their young, both from the ship and from our Zodiac boats. Uh, an amazing experience to be driving Zodiacs uh, with the sounds of a a herd of war was quite uh, challenging actually as a driver, um, but uh, phenomenal uh, to witness. Uh, here's a photograph. It's perhaps not the greatest photograph at first sight, but this for me sums up the excitement. You've got passengers, uh, guides, uh, waiters, chefs, as one of the waitresses in her black slippers, all rushing out on the way back to see yet another bear. But of course, yet another bear is still a magic bear, this time a mother and her cub on an ice flow off Franz Joseph, and again, totally unfazed and unbothered by the presence of so large a ship. Perhaps we see a bear ashore. This is on uh, an island we were looking for walruses, actually, and lo and behold, a polar bear hunting walruses uh, on this island. R real nature watching on a par with anything you might see in a BBC or a Netflix uh, wildlife documentary. Uh, you know, I can take a shot like that with an iPhone. So bring your expensive cameras and I guarantee you some wonderful photographs. Uh, and to pick up the history point, um, yeah, American history, British history and Russian history too. We have access to a former Soviet uh, weather station. This is a, a, a brilliant research base where uh, the, the Zeppelin airship uh, flew, would you believe? This is Tikhaya Bukhta. Um, it's now an open air museum. You can see the post box on the wall. So it's a highlight for passengers to 
there's a little gift shop there as well to um, write their postcards and post them and send them home. Here's the post box. Oh, it's not letting me go back to the post box. Uh, and an Arctic fox in its strange summer coat. You typically see them white, don't you? But um, all sorts of things to see if you take the time to see them. On oh, Franz Joseph, also brilliant, uh, beautiful uh, flora, uh, which isn't something you expect in the Arctic. Uh, beautiful mosses and plants. And ice. It is an archipelago filled with ice, like the layers of icing on a cake. Uh, and really, again, this is midnight. This is a photograph at midnight. So after dinner, people outside on deck and we have a, an iceberg watch as we've moved the ship into position during dinner. Passengers can come out and then return on board for a whiskey, more ice in their glass. Why not? So it really is spectacular. This particular moment at the season, we're able to meet both ships. So whilst uh, on uh, 50 years of victory, we're doing the North Pole voyages. My colleagues uh, are taking um, sea spirits uh, to Franz Joseph land specific itineraries. We find a lot of people will do a North Pole voyage and then realize that they want more time in Franz Joseph. And that's a good stepping stone to a, a longer trip from uh, Svalbard to Franz Joseph, just taking the time to explore. And as I said, there's, the possibilities are endless in this archipelago and Poseidon, really is the best in the business for this island group. Russian expertise, Russian permissions uh, to go where no other company uh, is able uh, to go. Uh, so that's it. The voyage often ends with a, a team shot. This is another North Pole. So look, at, look how different the weather was that time. We can't guarantee you sunshine, uh, but we can absolutely guarantee you ice <laughs> without a shadow of a doubt. I think for many people, uh, one of the enduring happinesses is the people that they meet. Um, perhaps it seems uh, at first sight a little, I don't know, daunting or unusual to be thrown onto a ship with all sorts of nationalities, but I really see that as a big advantage, both as Poseidon as a truly international company, but the North Pole is a voyage that is international. This is a, a sense of achievement that uh, can unite people from many uh, countries. Uh, maybe for you, it's just the feeling of sunshine on your face before heading out onto the sea ice. You can see the North Pole sign and circle has already been erected by my expedition uh, team. For me, that's the pleasure of a North Pole voyage, absolutely. The feeling of being out in the wilderness, but also the joy of traveling on an expedition ship like this that really is a ship like no other on this uh, planet. Uh, I won't continue to talk because I think it'd be rather nice to have questions. I mean, we'll, we'll certainly wrap up 50 minutes in, maybe 10 minutes of questions. Uh, I can't see, um, technology baffles me sometimes, I can't actually see uh, the chat function, Steve. So maybe you'll be able to field some questions. Uh, I'm happy to chip in with some answers, but please go ahead. I have a couple of questions, and, uh, but everyone, please feel free to uh, ask us a couple of more. Um, you, one of the questions was, you know, how much time are we at the North Pole? And um, when I went, we were there for pretty much a full day. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing to me was that <clears throat> during that time that we were parked in the ice at the North Pole, we shifted almost two miles. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to remember that the, the ice is constantly shifting, moving in the Arctic. And it's, it's imperceptible. You don't notice it at all, but it's an amazing fact. Um, while you're having a good time, uh, having barbecue or taking a hike or doing a polar plunge, we're, we're, we're moving. <laughs> well, it is an amazing thing to remember. As I said, we, at Poseidon, we, we take pride in making very difficult expeditions seem straightforward. It's far from straightforward getting a ship to this particular point. Standing on ice a few meters thick with an ocean 4,000 meters deep beneath your feet. And of course, uh, you know, at the North Pole, it's constantly moving, the ice is constantly moving too. Depending on ice conditions determines how long we have actually on the ice at the pole itself. As I say, if a polar bear arrives, it's back on the ship as, as quick as we can. Um, typically, we'd arrive at the pole on the approach during an evening, uh, overnight at the pole, so you're sleeping on the ship, but at the pole, whilst with the captain and the expedition uh, senior officers, we're trying to find a safe uh, place to uh, to park the ship essentially secure the ship with ice anchors and uh, and then establish a safe area um, you know at particular times in the year the ice is broken maybe we have open patches of 
uh, of, of ocean. You'll see in the photograph um, what looks like water. Those are actually melt pools on the surface of the ice. That's totally normal. Um, but we have to establish an area that's large enough for us to hike. But often with a hike, you'll be, you know, walking over or through puddles. We equip you with good rubber boots. That's all you need for an expedition like this. Um, and um, yeah, we'll have a personalized bespoke swimming pool that the ship carves at the rear of the ship uh, that you can dive into that inky, inky water. Uh, as Steve mentioned, all these activities that we fill a day um, by about four, four o'clock, typically we're on the move again. That always seems long enough. Uh, it's getting cold actually often by that time in the afternoon if you've been out on the ice all day. And um, we, we, I've, I don't think I've ever had a passenger who's felt they haven't had long enough at the pole. But certainly I do have passengers who wish that they could go back uh, to the pole. As certainly the, the, the farther away from the North Pole you are, the, 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 the more the experience sort of solidifies into something truly memorable. It's exciting at the time and it's one of those achievements that get, gets better. Um, yeah, you, here's, years another, here's another couple of questions. You can probably answer them in one fell swoop. One is um, when we're parked in the ice, what keeps us in position? You mentioned ice anchors earlier. Maybe you can just quickly ex explain how they work. And then also, what do we use for, for polar bear protection when we're at the North Pole and or Franz Joseph Land, the other opportunity when we're off the ship? Very good. So yes, the ship, um, it being such a large ship, it, it effectively anchors itself in the ice. We park into position, we carve our own dock uh, into the ice. Uh, we put the anchors over the side to test the thickness of the ice. In fact, if the ice can hold the tonnage of a ship's anchor, absolutely it's safe enough to walk on. In fact, safe enough for us to land a helicopter on, which we've also done many times. Uh, we put some anchor, uh, some ice stakes and anchors in often, you know, just for an added sense of security. But effectively, we're drifting with that ice flow uh, all the while, all through uh, the day. Uh, we have a polar bear perimeter, as I said. Uh, we have highly skilled firearms experts from the Russian National Parks who are with us, as well as, you know, obviously members of our team are polar bear trained. But uh, Russian expertise with Russian rifles establishing a perimeter. Uh, and the same on Franz Josef Land. Um, it's a requirement of our permitting to obviously have highly trained polar bear experts uh, on the team. Uh, and that is what, how we do it. We, when we land ashore, I would always go ashore first with the Russian rangers and the team and we establish a safe uh, zone and we have briefings about where and when uh, and you can walk within that zone. Uh, but it doesn't by any stretch feel like you're hemmed in. We don't flag or rope out a zone. It's uh, an eye line site. So absolutely, you, you have a sense of being out in the wilderness, unsort of confined, uh, but all the while, eyes are watching. And as, as the example of the polar bear at the North Pole is that whilst I'm on the ice directing things, also I'm in radio contact with the bridge, and we have officers on the bridge keeping a polar bear watch from height, which was absolutely crucial to the polar bear visit last year. The polar bear, we could saw it many kilometers away approaching, so we were able to do a, a very orderly, neat evacuation. You, I got a, another question about, um, I mean, you're, you're obviously a very well qualified um, polar historian. That's your, your passion and your love. And you're always happy to talk about that with, with passengers, either informally uh, when they meet with you face to face or, or during presentations. Um, can you just give a kind of a, an idea of what some of the other specialists are that we typically have on board and what they talk about uh, during our trip, both Absolutely. north and south. Absolutely. I mean, so, yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's another big strength of this team. So um, firstly, you know, b because of the international nature of our clients, we have expedition staff who are experts in their field, but also uh, have multiple uh, languages. Uh, a glaciologist, perhaps, uh, famous photographers, uh, a meteorologist, German meteorologist, she gives lectures. We have a sea ice scientist, polar bear expert. We typically have a history lecture um, each day, if we can, uh, a natural history lecture, maybe it's on uh, walrus or whales or polar bears, multiple uh, polar bear lectures if we're seeing lots of polar bear lectures and want to analyze behavior that we've seen that day. We can show films and various things. Um, uh, yeah, and we also have guest speakers. So again, if I give you an example of last year, uh, Sergei Gorshkov, a very famous conservation photographer was showing footage of his experiences 
um, and famous filmmakers, Jim, James Baylog, uh, perhaps some of your clients have seen uh, Chasing Ice, but he came with us a previous season and gave a world premiere of his film in actual fact, The Human uh, Element. Um, the expedition team for this season, alas, postponed, uh, was filled with expertise. Um, uh, preeminent Icelandic photojournalist, a man called Ragnar Axelsson. I would encourage any of your clients to, to Google him. Rax, one of the best polar photographers uh, in the business. Uh, and my wife, I mentioned her, of course, she grew up in Greenland. She's an author uh, and public speaker and tells stories about um, female explorers as much as all the beardy guys in, in their wooden ships. So a real combination of storytelling as much as informative uh, briefings about the things we're seeing. And briefings also given in multiple languages. So uh, depending on the size of groups, we have breakaway lectures in uh, Russian or in German or in uh, Mandarin, or uh, multiple simultaneous translation of, of lectures and other events. So it's a, quite a complicated, but we hope very satisfying uh, onboard lecture program. Yeah, perfect. You uh, maybe I should just mention that you you alluded to the fact that we did um, postpone our entire uh, 2020 um, uh, North Pole season, uh, which of course was unfortunate for for all of us. Uh, it's our premier uh, program, uh, Poseidon Expeditions, and of course a bigger disappointment for those guests that had had paid and were ready to go, and and fortunately. Um, nearly all of them have uh, rescheduled uh, and we've transferred their bookings to 2021. Uh, we have three departures scheduled and there's always a possibility that we could add a fourth. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are scheduled uh, for July 10th, 21st and August 1st of 2021 next summer. Yeah, um, I, would, and I would, sorry to interrupt you, I would add to that. It's um, first, I can imagine the frustration, you know, for many people, this is a, a trip of a lifetime. Uh, for myself included as staff, you know, absolutely, there is nowhere we'd rather be right now than at the North Pole. But of course, for a trip like this, you know, impossible to, to, to do, even if we could in this uh, international situation. Also, we want to achieve a trip in as safe way as possible. And, um, you know, whilst we have a very, very good medical facilities on the ship, uh, certainly, uh, COVID wasn't something to be taken lightly. Um, those passengers who are coming with us next year, all I can say is fantastic, and I look forward to seeing you. And the sense of achievement when we do finally get to the North Pole, uh, well, I hope, will be uh, even greater. Certainly, times like this with COVID uh, help us recalibrate and think what matters and what's meaningful in life. And um, certainly, a trip to the North Pole, while some might think of it as a luxury, for others, it, it becomes a necessity to visit wilderness places, uh, you know, that really are very, very special parts of this shared planet. And to think a little more, to use the, the vacation time to think uh, of the things that really are important to us in life. So it will be a very special season next year. I hope we do have four, vo four voyages, but if it's only the three, then we'll make them absolutely the best voyages. I think on the flip side for the wildlife, it's quite good for them to have a year off, isn't it? Is it not? <laughs> Uh, to enjoy the peace and quiet at the North Pole. They're having their own, their own party there, I imagine, as we speak. Uh, but they'll absolutely be there for us next year, and the ice uh, will be too. Uh, you, one final question we just got. Um, somebody asked about age and, and the fact if, if there are children occasionally on board and uh, what, what our lower limit is on age, because I think a lot of people, uh, grandparents particularly, Look at, look at this as a wonderful opportunity to take their grandchildren on a once in a lifetime experience. Well, here's, here's the thing. I think, um, I'm sure there is a, poli a policy um, for, uh, for age. I, um, I can speak from direct experience. I um, have been very lucky that Poseidon have uh, enabled me to take my daughter a number of times on this voyage. She first came, she went in seven, eight, nine. She's now a sort of a member of our expedition team. Uh, and whilst I can understand for some passengers, the thought of a, a ship full of screaming children would be horrendous, it's never that way. Very well behaved children, a few children, often uh, sometimes children from the, from the crew also with us, but not, not often. Um, it is really a special experience. Uh, you, every holiday is special, but there's something about the North Pole, of course, 
And increasingly, we have found that grandparents are coming with their grandchildren. I mean, grandchildren doesn't necessarily mean super young children, you know, children, um, young adults in their 20s also, and people beginning families. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, we have people from all ages. I've, I've said before, we also have adults who behave like children, which is good. Adults who come to a trip like this with the enthusiasm of children. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head the eldest passenger, but I've regularly had passengers in their 90s. My uh, mantra as an expedition leader really is to enable people to achieve more than they think possible. And if people show the right willing and the right spirits, uh, we'll do our level best to get them on the ice. We had a, an incredible young fellow in his wheelchair at the, um, at the North Pole last year. I've had people in wheelchairs and Zodiacs. Whilst it's not uh, normal, uh, absolutely with Poseidon, we make um, things possible. Uh, you'll find the expedition team and the, and the passengers really do uh, mix and, and mingle. And it becomes, a, in every sense, a, a feeling of a, a family or an expedition experience, um, young or old. And there is a, uh, an elevator on board the ship, which facilitates quite a lot of people. Um, I generally like using the stairs uh, yeah. to get around the ship, but there is an elevator on board for passenger use. There, there absolutely is. I should say, um, you know, again, a bit of exercise is good. We're aware that some passengers are unable to use the stairs. Uh, the elevator, you know, cannot always be used. It's important to, to, to state that sometimes in difficult conditions, for safety reasons, that elevator will not be working. Um, so that's absolutely worth bearing it in mind. But, you know, I've known expedition staff to put people across their shoulder and get them in and out of a boat if necessary. Um, really, uh, as I say, if, if it's your ambition to get to the North Pole, uh, we will do our level best to get you there in comfort and safety. Okay, Steve, um, I'm not sure if you've got any more uh, questions. I think that's probably more than enough uh, for the day. Uh, we'll finish with a couple more slides. Uh, some people will travel all the way to the North Pole for the sake of a photo. Why not? I have. Uh, but for other people, it's the experience of being out within this wilderness of ice. The history of the wildlife, the sense of um, camaraderie on, on a vessel uh, like this. And whilst uh, we're obviously sad that uh, we're unable to do any voyages this year, uh, we have just pressed pause on our operations and uh, we'll be back with full strength uh, next year for more of the same. Uh, I, for my own part, I say thank you. Unless there are any other questions, thank you, Steve, for arranging this. Uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, I think we, I think we pretty much covered it, you. And uh, we want to thank you, of course, for joining us uh, uh and, and giving us uh, a, a insight into your your own experiences as expedition leader and just as a as a passenger and a human being on such an amazing trip of course if anybody has any additional questions they're free to send us an email i think our email address was on the uh invitation and the acknowledgement that you received from us and we'll be following up as well with uh with some links to the interview with the captain uh we we mentioned, uh, which is quite fascinating. He talks a bit more about the technical aspects of the ship, uh, which is really a work of art in many respects. <laughs> so anyway, we want to thank everybody for joining us. We hope you have a super nice, relaxing weekend. And always feel free to contact us at any time if you have further questions. And we look forward to seeing you sometime on one of our vessels. <laughs>